hundred uprooted trappers and explorers and, and so forth into the uh, water parties of Sturgeon and Grant Canyon uh, in 1864. Uh, our speaker is Rick Woodcock. Rick is the chief curator of the Sarah Hall Museum. Uh, he's been employed uh, in the curatorial department for 42 years, I think it is. Coming up on 42. Coming up on 42. He's I'm getting ahead of things. So, uh, Thank you. Anyhow, he's, he is a, uh, a graduate of uh, the University of Arizona mm -hmm. in history. He's uh, spent his practice days his whole life here in, uh, in Prescott. Uh, he is uh, the person who founded the Living History Program at the museum. He was very instrumental in uh, starting the Fort Whitman Museum out at the, uh, on the Veterans Administration's grounds. Uh, he, uh, several years ago, won a prestigious award from the uh, Oregon Association of uh, Living History and a whole bunch of other things that I can never remember. Uh, <laughs> but, but he, uh, and a prolific writer, a great historian, Thank you, Fred. Now, now all I have to do is live up to the uh, <laughs> Fred's expectations here. So, exploring Arizona, you probably, how many of you have looked at the exhibit? Uh, about half, okay. Well, um, I won't be offended if you decided to take, to take a nap here. <laughs> so, Arizona. The name Arizona probably comes from a Basque word meaning the good oak tree. Bernardo de Urea, uh, a Spaniard of Basque heritage, established the village of Arizona in northern Sonora around 1735. A couple of years later, they discovered silver there, and it's mentioned in uh, Ignaz Pfefferkorn's Pfeffer uh, report, Sonora, a description of the province. Pfefferkorn was a Jesuit priest uh, in Arizona between 1756 and 1767. So Arizona's unique landscape is a result of complex geologic history. This is a, geo a topo map of Arizona uh, made in 1923, and it was created, uh, Arizona's created from, in. Uh, couple of different things, but uh, it has environments ra that ranged from warm, shallow seas to windy desert dunes and from violent volcanic eruptions to just lava flows that uh, were particularly violent. Two different landscapes shape Arizona. And you've probably all been to the Grand Canyon, but the Basin and Range Province in the southwest and the Colorado Plateau province in the north are separated by a transition zone. So these re result in major contrasts in population, agriculture, industry, water supply, and tourist attractions. Most people live in Metro Phoenix or Metro Tucson. This is not to slight Yuma, but uh, people live in the valleys of the Basin and Range province. Uh, the broad valleys offer greater, <coughs> greater uh, groundwater availability, so they can support these. For that reason, more industry and agriculture exist in this province uh, than any of the others. I, I will admit that we're getting a pretty good size uh, population here, and of course Flagstaff is a, <coughs> a big center. But uh, we live in the transition zone. And no, this is not us, this is Jerome. But Prescott's located in the transition zone, shares the characteristics of both provinces. So we've got a little sedimentary rock uh, from uh, the Colorado Plateau. We also have mountains, which are characteristic of the basin and range. Now, I, I like to tell people that one of the reasons Prescott exists, and the only reason it exists, is mineral resources. Arizona has mineral resources. So uh, this is a geologic map of Arizona, 1924. 
And <coughs> to uh, quote the Arizona miner from March 9th, 1864, so the town is just not even established. People are coming here and they say, there is not a richer mineral region in the world. The mountains are literally interlaced with silver veins while the recent discoveries of gold uh, denote an almost unparalleled profusion of that precious ore. So the Colorado Plateau uh, hosts national parks and tourist attractions such as the Grand Canyon. The geology is the sedimentary rock layer cut by canyons that allow water to drain away. So water is precious here. Okay. If you've been to Monument Valley, red sandstone in, in some places are eroded into these wonderful mesas and uh, buttes marking <coughs> photographic vistas uh, that John Ford used in some of his westerns back in the day. All of the uh, energy resources produced in Arizona, such as coal, uranium, and oil, are in this area. Moving to the south, this is Lavender Pit. So it's a copper mine, it's name, it was named. I always thought, oh, hey, it's the lavender color. No, the guy, it was named for a man named Harrison Lavender, who originally started, uh, <coughs> or was a, a part of the company, and he figured out how to mine the ores on uh, a place called Sacramento Hill. This hole started out as a hill feature that. So anyway, the basin and range, as well as the transition zone, have mines. Mines that yield important metals. Uh, many of the open pit copper mines occur in the basin and range, uh, although we do have one in Baghdad, so we're, that's kind of on the edge. The diverse mineral deposits are due to mountain building episodes and intrusions of ig igneous rock. The ebb and flow of oceans and the historic volcanic activity across Arizona give the richness of the mineral and fossil record. And so this is a watercolor done by uh, Lillian Wilhelm Smith, who is a resident here. Uh, she did this in the 1950s. Mining goes way back in Arizona. Arizona's prehistoric inhabitants used its geology to their advantage. Utilizing simple tools, they quarried basalt and obsidian for tools and malachite, azurite, and argillite for ornamentation. Much of this was traded away for other things. Salt deposits in the Verde Valley, and this is the Verde Valley salt mine, were worked off and on. Uh, stone tools recovered from uh, mining in the 1920s there indicated that the Camp Verde salt mines had been uh, mined more than 600 years ago by uh, prehistoric people. It was reported that when the site of the Silver Belt Mine, and you can see on the building there, it says Silver Belt. The Silver Belt Mine, and this is, was in Yavapai County uh, over by Dewey, discovered in 1870, that uh, when they found it, there were stone tools and other evidence that the deposit had been worked by native inhabitants. Don't know how far back that goes, but. So, bring on the Spanish. Spanish exploration in Arizona was sporadic, I guess is a good word. Uh, Francisco Vasquez de Coronado reported on his uh, trip to Arizona and New Mexico, he said, neither gold nor silver nor any trace of either was found. So much for uh, the search for El Dorado. During the 1500s, Spanish explorers rode northwest from Mexico in quest of converts to Christianity and mineral wealth that would rival the treasures of the Aztecs and Incas. No such luck. In 1583, an expedition under Antonio de Espejo found copper and silver in the mountains near modern-day Jerome. By 1599, Marcos de Farfan de Godot's party 
had returned to the area. They did not find mineral riches, but discovered the Verde Valley. And it had beautiful, splendid pastures, fine plains, and excellent land for farming. That's what they said. But the uh, <coughs> Spanish never stayed to farm, ranch, or mine. So figure that. So there's uh, the Verde Valley. So Coronado, and this is not Coronado, by the way, uh, just a little bit on him. In 1540, Captain General Francisco Vasquez de Coronado commanded an expedition from Mexico seeking the reported riches of the seven cities of Cibola. They crossed the Gila River and went uh, through parts of Arizona, including the Colorado Plateau, without discovering any kind of wealth. In 1583, Antonio de Espejo led nine Spaniards and nearly 150 Zuni into Arizona. They were as f went as far as Jerome, where they found precious minerals. The party returned to New Mexico with silver ore, yet years passed before anything became of that. In 1598, Captain Marcos Farfan sought a salt spring in Arizona, and when he found that, he uh, moved on. He only had eight men with him. These, these guys are just traveling around in the wilderness pretty much by themselves. <coughs> he located silver near Prescott, yet the Spanish again made no uh, serious effort to establish mining operations. So uh, that's, uh, and this, getting to uh, uh, Farfan he returned to uh, New Mexico, and then this uh, prompted Juan de Oñate, and these are uh, <coughs> an artist's uh, depiction of the Oñate uh, expedition. They trekked into Arizona. In 1604, his party reached uh, the fork of the Bill Williams River, went down to the Colorado, and then on to the Gulf of California before returning eastward. And that's it for the Spanish. They're done. <laughs> you know, they find, they find mineral resources, but they never capitalize on it. So, we fast forward to the 1820s, and uh, we have, uh, just a little bit earlier, we have the uh, Louisiana Purchase. This opens up the, kind of the central west, and uh, one of the big things is beaver trapping, beaver uh, skins uh, <coughs> for top hats and all kinds of hats. Uh, beaver fur was for, uh, really uh, popular. And Arizona had beavers. And uh, the thing is, uh, beavers were trapped here, but uh, what would become Arizona was Mexican territory, was not part of the Louisiana Purchase. And at the beginning of the fur trade era, Americans could come in, they could live in uh, the Mexican territory, but Mexican officials would not give them a license to trap. They said, no licencia por americanos. That didn't stop the guys, but uh, anyway, um, there were a number of trapping expeditions. Uh, Ewing Young, James Ohio, Patty, and others went to the Gila Salt and Colorado Rivers in the 1820s and 1830s. These were all illegal expeditions. So the beaver in the Southwest was, and this is probably more information than you want, but Castor canadensis mexicanus, a lighter color and uh, thinner fur version of the northern, its northern cousins. So fewer in number on Arizona streams, it only took a few expeditions to trap them out to low levels so they, they were not worth uh, trapping. Because of trapping and finally man's diversion of water starting in the 1880s in Arizona for agricultural use, uh, the native beaver population just disappeared. They went away. Beavers were reintroduced using the northern beaver, Castor canadensis canadensis. Just a little bit bigger, darker, 
heavier fur, you probably wouldn't know the difference in, unless you had them side by side. And there are still uh, <coughs> the Mexicanus uh, version down in Mexico. Why they didn't go down there and bring those up, who knows? Well, in 1846, a uh, war erupted between the United States and Mexico, and in 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo brought an end to this uh, conflict. The, the document signed and the subsequent 1854 Gadsden Purchase prompted, prompted the United States government to launch a series of expeditions led by army officers to explore, map, rec and record information about the geography, geology, and natural history of the newly acquired Southwest. And so that's uh, what we're gonna take a look at exploring the newly acquired territory. So the army had uh, explored the rivers and travel routes of what be would become Arizona. And this was a, a carefully thought out phased uh, program. This, uh, each uh, one of these expeditions had an artist with it. This is before Photography was uh, real portable, so here we have Mojave uh, Indians crossing the Colorado. And with a series of four expeditions that were conducted by the Army Corps of Topographical Engineers in the 1850s, they re mapped uh, the remote parts of the new lands acquired from Mexico. So this is uh, a sketch of uh, the Whipple ex expedition. The very first one was the Sit Greaves Zuni and Colorado River Survey, followed by the Whipple Railroad Route Survey, then the Ives Colorado River Survey, and finally the Beale Wagon Road Survey. And they all helped open central Arizona to settlement during the territorial period. Interesting thing is, this is Francois Javier Aubrey, and <coughs> he's a civilian. Uh, of Canadian birth, a traveler of the Great Plains, and by the time he became acquainted with what's now northern Arizona, he uh, was about 20, uh, I think he was about 24, 25 years old. But uh, in 1852, Aubrey took a herd of sheep down the Colorado River route to California, and then the next year, he takes another herd across what uh, would, we would know as the I-40 route. So he returns to New Mexico. His, he makes a, a report on this, very detailed notes, and it's published in uh, 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 the local newspaper in Santa Fe, uh, but uh, Mr. Aubrey uh, got himself in a knife, a knife fight with a Richard uh, White Waitman, uh, which he came out second best in. So Aubrey's out of the picture, uh, killed by Waitman, but his, his uh, report is used by army officers to plan the, uh, the I-40 travel. So the Sit Greaves expedition, and there are no surviving uh, photos of Sit Greaves, so <laughs> this is his, his physician, Dr. Samuel Woodhouse. What can I say? So, to quote Woodhouse, incredible report, and I've read most of it, but a quote, he says, since we left Bill Williams Fork, there have been clouds seen every day, and anxiously did we watch for rain, but this seemed a thing impossible, to rain in this miserable country where everything appears to be an enemy and is armed with a thorn or a poisonous sting. Did he call that right or what? So Lorenzo Sitgreaves himself graduated from West Point in 1832, and uh, he, you know, after all that, he resigns and, and becomes a civil engineer. And then back in and then in 1840, he decides, well, I want to, I want back in the army. So he gets back in, and he commands the first exploring expedition along the 35th parallel. 
So uh, the mission of the uh, Zuni and Colorado River Survey was to see if the Zuni River, Little Colorado River, and Colorado River were navigable. Um, they started at the Zuni villages in September of 1851, and they had Antoine LaRue as their guide. And you need to remember his name because he comes up again and again. Now, the plan, uh, as soon as they got on the road and got into Arizona, which was st still New Mexico at that time, had to be modified. So they headed west to intersect the Colorado River below the Grand Canyon. They just, they just ran into the Grand Canyon so they uh, could not possibly do anything uh, other than uh, go to the Colorado below this. So it become a route for the Santa Fe Railroad in years to come. Now, Anton LaRue, they're, they're in, these are probably wallopies, but uh, they have some brush with the natives, and Antoine LaRue received two arrow wounds before reaching the Colorado River. And Dr. Woodhouse was wounded by a Mojave arrow at the Colorado River. And Woodhouse, had, it, it, he didn't fare well on this expedition. Before he even left the Zuni villages, he had uh, thought he had killed this rattlesnake, and he took his... Uh, his shotgun ramrod and picked the thing up and it bit him on the thumb and he nearly died but the great thing about being a physician is he recorded the whole thing so you can see how miserable he was so anyway uh, the trip down the Colorado, Colorado River proved harrowing with attacks from both the Mojave and the Yumas and uh, not a good thing this is uh, the uh, some Wallapies sketched by uh, the artist. Whipple Railroad Survey Route. So this is indeed Amiel Weeks Whipple, uh, or at least a drawing of him from a photograph. He was born in Massachusetts in 1817, and he entered West Point, and after a year, uh, this was after he'd gone to Amherst College for a year, and he graduated fifth in a class of 41. This is in 1841. So a fine, uh, following assignment to the Corps of Topographical Engineers, he acted as a surveyor for public works projects, a military reconnaissance in Louisiana, and the boundary surveys of Canada and Mexico. So this is, uh, this is his uh, sketch of his men at the Petrified Forest, uh, probably lithodendron wash, but uh, this uh, is fairly uh, well known. So in 1853 and 1854, Whipple, guided by, who else, Antoine LaRue, commanded the Pacific Railroad Survey through northern Arizona along the 35th par parallel. With him were Heinrich Baldwin Mulhausen as artist and naturalist and Lieutenant Joseph Ives as his assistant. We'll catch Ives a little later. So the collections and reports from the survey provided the most complete description of the landscape, plants, and wildlife that had been gathered. Northern Arizona's Chino, and the, in Northern Arizona, and this is a sketch of Chino Valley. They never actually got up in here. They just kind of skirted it. The Beale Wagon Road Survey, so this is Edward Fitzgerald Beale in his kind of later years. He's uh, famous for using camels in his, uh, his survey. And so Beale wrote that the camels are now keeping up easily with the train and came into camp with the wagons. They were a little slow on the uptake, but uh, Beale himself uh, graduated from the Philadelphia Naval Asylum School. Uh, I'll tell you about that, in 1842. But uh, he was following a family tradition of being a Navy officer. The, basically, the asylum school was a, a grouping of buildings that had the, the uh, 
old sailor's home, a hospital, and the precursor to the Naval Academy at Annapolis. So it was the Navy school, but they called it the asylum. It was a collection of buildings. <coughs> Beale himself was born in 1822 in the District of Columbia. Both his father and grandfather were Navy officers. In 1845, he was sent to California and subsequently uh, served on land there during the war with Mexico. So Beale gets tired of the Navy in 1851, resigns, and, but he, he doesn't give up on the West. He becomes a catalyst for Congress appropriating $30,000 in 1857 for the purchase of camels for use in military transportation. Camels, camels in, the, in America. So, He was appointed, and he's a civilian. This is a military expedition, but he was appointed to survey a wagon road across the 35th parallel, using camels to transport his equipment. The camels worked well, but were lost in the shuffle of the nation uh, preparing for war. And the interesting thing is, is, is the Secretary of War at time was Jefferson Davis, who was later the President of the Confederacy. Odd stuff. So camels, the, there's a, an entire report, which we have in archives, on buying these camels. It's called the Report of the Secretary of War Communicating in Compliance with a Resolution to, of the Senate of February 2nd, 1857, information respecting the purchase of camels for the purpose of military transportation. Oh my. So anyway, the army imported camels, and these illustrations are from that report. So Congress appropriated money to buy these camels and have them shipped to Texas as an experiment in desert transportation. So the, uh, they wound up buying 75 camels. They cost, as I said, $30,000, and the uh, first acquisition was 33 animals. Uh, for use. Now, one hump or two. When, here's Americans over in the Middle East going, camels, what are these? We don't know anything about camel, camels. The detail was to differentiate between the one-hump variety, the Arabians, and the two-hump variety, Bactrians. Arabians were, and to make it more interesting, Arabians were further broken down into camels, just plain old camels, beasts of burden, and then there were dromedaries used for riding. I mean, there's no difference in the kind of animals, just the training and the use. So the report detailed the purchase and the information for camel care. And so here's a, a beast of burden. What does it say? Oh, a tuilu. Tuilus are a cross between a, a, a camel, a one hump, and a two hump. I think maybe they had one of these. Well, not only did they import camels, but they imported camel drivers. So they brought native drivers to a good idea because uh, camels are, are real specific. This guy winds up staying here. He was called High Jolly. And uh, originally his name was Haji Ali, but you know how Americans are. We're gonna, we're gonna anglicize his name. He becomes High Jolly. Born in Syria in 1828, uh, he uh, decided to stay in America. So he goes with Beale to California, later makes his way to Arizona, working as a scout for the Army, and eventually winds up in Tucson. So this is a camel. This is drum barracks, kind of outside of San Diego, or in metro San Diego, I don't know and a probably a very concerned horse. <laughs> Apparently they did not get along well. 
So, so in Tucson in 1880, he becomes a naturalized citizen, and his name is Philip Tedrow. He marries Gertrude Serna, and this is their wedding photograph. And uh, he uh, stayed in Arizona for his whole life and actually moved to the western deserts, prospected, uh, traveled around, and, uh, and finally he had purchased camels in California that had been sold by the army because the army had no use for them. And uh, they were sold at auction in 1864. He used them in Arizona, later at releasing them into the desert. And he spent, or else, his final years in Quartzite, dying there in 1902. And so, if you've been to Quartzite, how many have been to Quartzite? Seen the monument, been there, done that. So that's the high, and it's still there, High Jolly Monument. Quartzite's claim to fame. The Ives Colorado River Survey, yes, this is Joseph Christmas Ives, born in 1829 in New York City, and he winds up a Confederate colonel. You figure that one out. You could probably Google that. Uh, so he graduates from West Point in 1852. He's assigned to the Corps of Topographical Engineers, and his first duty, as I said, was to accompany Lieutenant Whipple on his railroad survey. So, this, this assured his next assignment, which was a hydrologic and geologic survey of the Colorado River, the largest river in the country that had not been surveyed by the Army. And so the Army wants to know, can we navigate the Colorado? And to that end, Ives is equipped with the Explorer. It's kind of like an early man Ikea boat kit. Literally, they had to, they just haul this stuff over to the Colorado River and put it together. So the Explorer, I, Ives spends part of 1857 and 1858 traveling. He goes 530 miles up the river to determine the head of navigation. That was kind of part one. He then returns to uh, the Mojave Valley where he prepares for a land expedition that would survey along the edge of the Grand Canyon and uh, then take them to Fort Defiance before they uh, headed back. And as his uh, artist naturalist Bald Bald Heinrich Baldwin Mulhausen accompanied him. So Mulhausen made a couple of these trips. So this brings us uh, Ives, Ives' report, the uh, report upon the Colorado River, the West, real short title, was printed in 1861. You know, Ives is headed off to be a Confederate colonel. Uh, but the central mountains of Arizona are the only place that haven't really been explored. So where we're sitting in 1861, is Yavapai country, no Anglo has ever been up here. So, the man that we looked at there was Joseph Redford Walker, and the first group to arrive and find gold in the central mountains of Arizona were uh, the Joseph R. Walker Exploratory Party. They had this big long name. There were a lot of these guys. Originally, they started out in California. So the discovery was made in March 1863 on the headwaters of the Hacienda, ha, come on, Hacienda River in the Bradshaw Mountains, south of present day Prescott. And this is, if you look back up the Hacienda, way up there, that's where they're going. However, this is not the only gold found in the area. Rich Hill. At about the same time, a party organized by A.H. Peoples and guided by Paulino Weaver discovered gold at Rich Hill west of the Hacienda. And the reports are that you could just walk around and pick gold up off the ground. I've never done that, but that's what they said they could do. 
So, news gets out of claims being filed, and this, of course, brings other gold seekers to the area. This is a, a sketch called Arizona Gold Rush, uh, uh, published in Century Magazine in 1891. So, sure enough, Lynx Creek Gold kind of is the standard for our area here, because there were rich gold deposits on Lynx Creek, one of the most profitable sources of gold in the entire county. Uh, and I, I'm not sure when they figured this out, but they thought, they, uh, thought that as much as $1 million, that's back then dollars, of gold were recovered from Lynx Creek. And this is Bigelow's Flat, as you can see. If you kind of use your imagination, the, the dam is currently kind of in here, and the lake goes back like that. So it's all underwater these days. So placer gold remained, remains when gold-bearing rocks weather away, and uh, gold often collects in the gra gravel of stream beds. Placer miners used both wet and dry methods to recover gold from the sand. So here's a couple of guys on Lynx Creek in the 1890s living in their shack uh, and uh, trying to make a living panning gold. Prospectors washed stream bottom sands in a pan to separate the heavier gold nuggets and dust from the lighter sediments but they all also used, uh, ran gold-bearing sands through shakers into uh, through uh, screens and into tilted riffle boxes, which is kind of a, a bigger uh, method of recovering gold. Now, gold is not the only thing that's here. Peck mined silver. Silver mining was very important. One of the richest silver loads in Arizona was discovered by this group of guys. Edmund Peck, Thomas Alexander, Curtis Cobean, William Cole, and L.B. Jewell. And uh, Peck had scouted for the army and, and he's, he's in a, <laughs> a store one day and somebody brings in some, some ore and silver ore and said, and Peck sees it and he says, I know where some of that is. So he gets these guys to go in with him on this uh, expedition, I guess you'd call it. And the newspaper talks about it and they say, you know, these guys are having a hard time raising money to finance their, uh, their expedition. And so I'm reading between the lines here, but in 1881, there's a, a lawsuit, and the paper says, verdict brought by Mrs. Catherine Alexander, that'd be Thomas's wife, against Peck Mining Co Company to recover the value of the stock in that company, one for $80,000. In many respects, this is the most important case ever tried in the county, in the uh, courts of the territory. My guess is that Catherine Alexander had, like all ladies, a stash. And so Thomas, her husband, says, you've got to bankroll this. And she says, okay, stock in the company. And so they give her stock in the company, but when they come to sell the company, they don't honor her stock. And so she takes them to court, and she wins. So this will give you some idea of how rich um, these deposits were. So uh, Peck and his, his guys, they dug 10 tons of ore, which they sold to the Arizona Assay Office in Prescott for $11,000, $13,000, sorry. They used the money to develop the mine. It yielded about $1.5 million in silver between 1875 and 1885. That's a lot of money. These guys were smart, though. They had all these mining claims, and they knew not all of them were good, so they set aside some of them and sold lots to make a town. And so here's Alexandria. 
named for Thomas Alexander. Now, ore had to be crushed to make uh, the precious metal su uh, suitable for smelting. And the Ozatlan mill in Groom Creek was not the only mill around, but it was used to process some of the peck mine ore. And it, they did a lot of, they, they were doing all kinds of processing. And so it processed ore from various mines in the uh, area, and the owners of the peck got tired of having to wait in line, so they just bought the mill, and uh, so their ore could be worked first. And this photo is the dedication of the new shaft at the Peck Mine, September 3rd, 1903. So it's still producing uh, silver into the 20th century. And with that, there is a specimen uh, of the ore from the Peck Mining District, uh, <coughs> slightly enlarged for your enjoyment. <laughs> Actually, the, the piece in our collection is about the size of my fist. So, with that, I'll take questions. Yes? Where is the Peck Mine? Peck Mine is out in the vicinity of Dewey. There's a lot of mineral act, or was mineral mining back in there. The Peck Mining District, it, well, you know what? That's not true. Peck Mining District is back up towards uh, Cleeter, back in that area. Alexandria, the town site, I mean, there's nothing there, but it's back up on that road. Yes, ma'am. The company actually worked the mine. Oh, currently, no, it's, it's long filled in. It's not, not active. What, what can I tell you about it? Okay, uh, historically, I, I can't tell you anything about it now, but historically, uh, the vulture was probably the biggest uh, producer in the county. It's, it's a big mine early on. It is producing ore like crazy. It, it's, it's almost constantly in the newspapers about how much money they're getting out of it and how many mule trains and wagon trains that, they, you know, that they're... Uh, producing, so it's, it, was, it was big. And the thing about th this part of the country, the minerals are still there, they're just hard to get at, and, and they're not profitable. So that's why a lot of these have not been. Yeah. Yes, sir. Jerome is a long way from Mexico City. <laughs> Plus, they have the Zuni Uprising, which kind of just shuts everything down west of the Rio Grande. So, yeah, it's just too far away. Not enough. The thing is about uh, the conquest of Mexico and the conquest of Peru, the Aztecs and the Incas had already done the mining and the smelting. smelting. All the conquistadors were doing was coming in and taking, you know, they weren't putting any effort into to getting the metal out of the ground and, and, and working it. They're just ripping people off. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, so I, I think too much work, not enough profit, too far away from Mexico City. Yes? Um, Ives went 530 miles to what he referred to as the head of navigation. The answer to that is around Hardyville, which is kind of a cross from Boston. That was about as far as they could get up the river to obtain the supply line. Good answer. Anyone else? Questions you we're afraid to ask. <laughs> All right, Fred, thank you very much.